Cool. So, do do do. The scene here is really seems pretty solid, man. Like yeah, it's grown a lot. It's like from when I first started doing. I came here with Doug, I think, in 2009, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, it was good, man. It was, yeah, uh, you were actually a part of a, a big reason on why this scene started to grow and whatnot. Cause, uh, really? Yeah, because your, yours was one of the first uh, like shows that the local comedians brought the comedian down instead of some instead of them doing it themselves or some bigger organization bringing it down. And so because you were doing it, it inspired a lot of other comedians like myself and my friend Shane and whatnot. We started bringing comedians down and then there was some other comedians that started doing it too and whatnot. Sweet. So it's really helped the scene grow. Oh, dude, that's, that warms my heart. Yeah, you're, like I said, you're, you're a big influence on, a, on the Hawaii scene, oh, believe it or man, not. Oh, man, that's, the, that's the, so cool, dude. Also one of the inspirations to this podcast. Nice. Are we rolling? We yeah. are. Fuck yeah, I like it. Yeah, just get going. So um, we kind of let the conversation go where it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, we're inspired by uh, Nerdist and Joe Rogan and stuff like that, where it's just like, wherever it ends up going, it ends up going. Uh, but we do have some things that we do want to talk to you about. For sure. But before we get to that, let's go with... Hey, hi, hello. What are you up to? This is the Aloha Bro Ha Podcast. I am one of your hosts, John Cozy. And with me, as always, is Science Ben. What's up? And Ben, who do we have in the house tonight? We have comedian extraordinaire and uh, podcaster and documentarian Graham Elwood. Thanks, man. You guys are awesome. <laughs> How's that intro? Uh, that, was, that was great. <laughs> I love the Aloha Bro Ha. Like, yeah, I yeah, love yeah. it. I love the whole vibe. Yeah. The title came from a, a song. I'm a rapper, too. That's oh, why. Okay. And that was like one of our like popular songs from a couple of years ago. A few years ago, it was like Aloha Bro Ha. You know, <laughs> it was just a, like a, a Hawaii track. So that's kind of where we got the name for this. That's sweet. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, generally, we, we tend to talk about like subcultures and stuff like okay. that. So like I, I kind of talk about the, the comedy scene here and whatnot. Uh, he talks a lot about the hip hop scene. We have another host that couldn't make it today. And mm -hmm. uh, they talk about just the various music scenes in general and whatnot and all the little like things that most people don't get to hear about right. when they're just visiting Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, but today, since we have uh, a world famous podcaster, we're going to talk <laughs> about podcasting a bit. So, but yeah, I mean like uh, your show, uh, your show comedy film nerds has been a huge influence to me uh, just as far Thank as you. like, uh, my taste in film. Like, I, I knew that, like, I was getting better at understanding <laughs> film when I was sitting there. I was like, those are the opinions that I had when I watched the show. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, the the coolest thing about, uh, for me, podcasting is the, the, the sort of, it can be whatever it wants. Mm -hmm. And it can reach anybody. And then, you know, specifically... For film, I mean, Chris Mancini and I, you know, who who was my co-host on Comedy Film Nerds, we sort of were just like taking our the conversations we would have, like with comics, because mm -hmm. you go on the road and you have time to kill during the day, so you see movies, and then you'd hang out in the green room and be like, "What do you, man? I don't know. I like that scene and this scene." And plus, you know, living in LA and working in show business, you sort of get some insider info mm -hmm. that helps uh, sometimes. Yeah. So that that's been. That's been the coolest thing about it is is doing that, and then you know podcasting is, you know I was just in China, and Japan and Australia and mm -hmm. fans oh man hot shot first and they come up and I love your show I mean that that's like I've been doing show I've been in show business a long time I've done all these TV episodes and and never have reached anybody the way that this medium does mm -hmm. you know you guys are you know people can hear you all over the world. I yeah. mean, before you're like two guys on an Island, you know, literally like who, well, how could you get out the, get the word out without physically traveling everywhere uh -huh. and handing out your, your rap tracks or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And now you yeah. can just put it out there and people can find you. It's, yeah. the, it's the coolest thing in the world. Yeah, That's one of the amazing things about the internet is mm -hmm. like, uh, I think it's really changed what is defined as success now because it used to be like success was when like you were a household name kind of thing where now it's like you can be successful and it's just like your audience finds you and it doesn't need to be a giant millions of people audience. Like you can have a few thousand people or a couple thousand, like a, a tens of thousands of people and they just kind of, like I said, it's not a, like you were saying, it's not a lot of work that you have to put in to get yourself out there because mm -hmm. the audience tends to come and find you because they're looking for it too. The, I think, you know, one of the things that we, in, in interviews with, uh, in Earbuds, the podcasting mm -hmm. documentary that's almost done, uh, anyone listening doesn't know what it is, we, we raised $140,000 on Kickstarter to do this documentary. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. It's, um, 
it's it was one of the coolest and most stressful <laughs> things that you're ever going to go through. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, but the cool thing was is is I got to hear. I interviewed a lot of podcasters. Obviously, in the film, we're almost done with it. We're submitting it to festivals and and uh, like Todd Glass, who's been mm-hmm. a friend of mine for a long time, said something so. So interesting. He goes, because of your podcast, as a comedian, when you go on the road, the audience that comes out to see you is perfect. Mm -hmm. They're perfect because they get everything. They know everything about you. You don't have to explain, you know, like I've talked about on comedy filmers, how I like coconut water and, you know, Mm. I I drink, you know, a hippie vegan and all this (laughs) people. We did a show in Vegas a couple months ago and this guy shows up wearing a Palm Strike shirt and he brings coconut water and then like vegan, you know, granola bars or yeah. whatever. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> that is so badass, you know? Yeah, it's amazing. And the reach, it, like you said, it can go anywhere in the world. Like uh, there's a lot of people uh, that there, there's some people in like Zimbabwe and whatnot that we've seen downloads from and what and things like that. <laughs> oh, so yeah, it's crazy like, places. Like- yeah, it's like, Wow. And so yeah, we're like we're we're getting to a point now on our podcast. Shout where, out to Zimbabwe, I yeah, guess. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, we're we're getting to a point now on our podcast where we're trying to get more listener interaction. So mm-hmm. like even if it's just like comments on the thing, because right now we've had one person that's talked to us. Yeah, and we were so and he's excited so cool. when he emailed like, yes. us. This is like the first email we ever got from a listener in like uh, we've been doing this for over a year, a year now, about yeah. a year now. Yeah. I you know what the 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 thing I've noticed is and we talk about, you know, Chris and I talk about this, like, how can we engage the audience more? And it's mm-hmm. us, it kind of gets, it's, we have a sort of, film makes it easy because we can just say, what do you think about this movie? Or right, tell right. us who you mm-hmm. think is going to win the Oscar or whatever. So that's the thing, man. Start asking your audience questions. Okay. Uh, like, ask them, what do you guys think about this? Or have a poll or, or vote on something or, you know, whatever. Yeah, we can put that up on the website, too. Even just comments yeah. like, a, a lar- a, the format of our podcast, a lot of it was shaped by the fans mm-hmm. saying, oh, I love it when you talk about this or don't. T-. Like, we started doing spoiler episodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That started, I love those, by the way. They're you. so good. That started three and a half years ago uh, during, uh, I believe it was, it was The Dark Knight, um, where, uh, or maybe... No, it was I dark, think it was Rises, it was, wasn't it? Right, exactly. It was, you're right. It was Dark Knight Rises because that was 2012. And a fan wrote, oh, you guys, I really wish you would do an all-spoiler episode where you talk about the whole thing because I, I need to hear what you... And Because this movie was so intense for me and for a lot of people. Yeah. And we were like, okay, a fan suggested that. Mm-hmm. And then that's now, incredible. That's now, now that's like a thing. Now we call them spoiler apps. We've done 40 of them. They got their own theme. Yeah, they got their own theme song. Like we went to Australia to do one because a fan paid for us to do that. Yeah, the Star Wars, the, the big, uh, was, that was 300, correct? Episode 300. That was, that was a great episode too. Thanks, man. It was so cool. And that, that's another great example. A fan <laughs> paid us to fly to Australia yeah. just to hear that. He lives in Iowa. <laughs> and we get there and we're walking around this theater, you know, in, in, uh, in the suburban Melbourne mm-hmm. and there's fans and, you know, the Star Wars fan club is there and, and people are just coming up going, oh, hey, I listen to your podcast. I love your show. And, and uh, you know, t- it's hilarious shit. And the inside jokes. Yeah. Like you're wearing a Whistling Bane shirt. Like that's the greatest. Yeah. That's from the- <laughs> from Doug Love's movies. That whole, like I loved that so much. Actually, that's where I got turned on to, to your podcast uh-huh. was through Doug Love's movies. Oh, right on. See, yeah. That's the other thing too, is you find people <clears throat> in the weirdest ways. Mm-hmm. I just got an email from a, from like um, a writer that's, that does interviews and is trying to get a hold of this specific podcast. And he writes and just like, hey man, big fan of yours. I love your show. I saw the Whistling Banes at the Kremlin. <laughs> <laughs> just like that is such an inside joke. Um, that's how we started his email, I, and I love I love that world. Oh yeah, and even like the the shirt that I'm wearing, like there's inside jokes within it, which is with like the tour dates on the yeah. back. How it's just the most unorganized tour <laughs> ever, ever, jumping all around the world <laughs> in the the worst possible <laughs> order. It's just like it's great. Kazakhstan, Atlanta, like yeah. it just makes no sense, and the. The Gotham Stadium one, I put canceled. Yeah, like that's just a little private joke. To it's the movie. so good, and that's that's one of the my favorite things about um, 
comedy in general is when it gets super meta like that. And I think that having uh, an active listener base and putting out things regularly, you're able to build mm -hmm. those kind of inside jokes and be able to reference back on things and whatnot. And I think a lot of comedy, especially in like the alternative scene, has gotten very referential, which is good and bad. Mm -hmm. But I think if it's done right, it can be really amazing and funny, like how the, the shirt is and whatnot, like that the whole Gotham Stadium canceled and whatnot. That's amazing. <laughs> like you can't look at that and say that that isn't amazing. <laughs> It was one of the most fun things I've ever, I came up with. I was, we were doing Bane impressions and I was whistling a lot during Doug Love's movies and he was getting really annoyed at me. Mm -hmm. like, and this specific episode we did in Madison, Wisconsin, I think two years ago. And at the end of the show, he's like, all right, Graham, now do your plugs, whatever the fuck you're plugging. I was like, well, my new band, the Whistling Banes is going to be on tour and people just jumped on it. We're like, love it. I'm in. Yeah. And, and. Because, like, on the back, the tour dates are so insane. They go all over the world. And one, uh, about a year ago, um, you know, Comedy Film Nerds has a whole online store, right? So we mm -hmm. ship stuff to people. And somebody ordered, I think, uh, I think it was the Comedy Film Nerds Guide to Movies, our book. And it was a holiday season. And usually things are handled pretty. But the post office, for whatever reason, they usually do a great job. That's who we use. They do a great job. They, but he had tracking. So it was the holidays. So things got messed up. And he lived in, like, I don't know, Iowa, let's say. Mm -hmm. And the the... He was tracking it, and it was like it went to like Houston, then like Jersey, <laughs> then up to all these places. And he's like, "What the? Who fucking did this? Was it the Whistling Bane's tour manager?" <laughs> Which is just like that's such an awesome joke. He was pissed off, rightfully so. And but the, his joke about it was just so inside. Yeah, that's so great, and that's that's one of the the best things about doing this kind of stuff is you get to connect with people that you normally would never get to. Mm -hmm. So um, well, another thing that we want to talk about is more about the documentary. I know you gave uh, you got to show a rough cut at uh, the LA Podfest, mm -hmm. which is something that you and Chris started, right? We started with Dave Anthony. Okay, uh, it was actually Dave Anthony's idea, okay. and he does that. You know, the dollop he used to do, walk in the room mm -hmm. with Greg Barrett. So Dave came to Dave was like working as if he would write articles for us at Comedy Film Nerds, and was a guest on it. He wrote uh, some stuff for us, and he just. It was in the spring of 2011, said, you know, let's do this. What do you think about a podcast festival? And Chris and I were like, oh, man. And it was really the first one of its kind. Yeah, it was. Absolutely. Because yeah, like, they, they've had groups of podcasts together at like Sketchfest and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but they've never had a festival that's dedicated to yeah, podcasts. Yeah, and there's one, I mean, there's some tech ones, like there's Podcast Movement, which is a really cool one, but it's mm -hmm. really for technical professionals. And it's like, the, how do you, you know, it's like panels on the gear more and, of a convention than it's a, a festival. far more yeah more of a convention for sure and so um there's some new ones now that are starting to pop up but you know that and the cool thing we were like oh this will be great because as a comic going on the road like i've said you meet these podcast fans they come up to you all over the place mm -hmm. and i remember when he came up with that idea we were like oh if we got them all under one roof you know, and everyone's wearing these inside joke shirts like Whistling Banes or Bag of Corn Friend from Never Not Funny or mm -hmm. whatever. Every show has a... Enjoy your burrito, whatever exa exactly. it is. Exactly. Yeah. They all have an inside joke. Um, and like Walk in the Room had nope. Um, and so we're, you know, Dave came to Chris and I were like, okay, uh, and and let's do this. So then we, we hired uh, Andy Wood, who was working at the Bridgetown Comedy Festival, to come and be the festival director to sort of help with the logistics of a lot of it and we put the put it up on kickstarter we were trying to raise 20 grand mm -hmm. in 30 days we raised the first 18 in the first four days so we were like this is going to happen and nice. people were just like flipping out like oh yeah. my god i remember that first year i remember introducing the sklar brothers the sklar bro country mm -hmm. uh it was a friday night at the first year of the festival in, in 2012 and and i just walked on stage and went just went we did it and there was this this like explosion of like no way, you know, like, yeah. and all these like podcast nerds. And, and the thing that's been so, so great about it um, is now we just did the fourth year this past September mm -hmm. and Audible came on as a big sponsor, which was great. And we're at the Sofitel, which is this beautiful hotel. And we do our opening night sort of happy hour party before the first show start. And there was this table full of people and, and, and I'm at the party and they're like, Graham, Hey, how you doing? They're like, Hey man, We've come every year. The first year we all came alone, and now we're all friends. They live all over the country. Nice. And that's the thing, because I think a lot of podcast fans, you listen alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you, there's so many people, especially, it's getting better, but who are just like at your job or your friends who are like, what's this podcast? And you try to explain it to them. Oh, yeah, all like, the time, <laughs> man. All the time. I feel like Hawaii is kind of late. 
on the whole podcast thing. Mm-hmm. You know, not many people really listen to a podcast, but I've, ever since doing this, I've been finding more and more people that understand what the medium is. Yeah, when we when yeah. we started doing this, we actually found out that there there used to be a group of the the more technical side podcasters right. out yeah. here, uh, and then. There was a nice. They, they had a strong little group back when podcasting first like kind of started. Ten years ago, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I met and one then, Bruce Fisher. I've done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were on his show yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, no. The, the, that whole group was going. They've been going for a while. But like, uh, they had a, a fairly strong group. And then I guess little by little, uh, a few of them started falling off here and there. Mm-hmm. You know, other things came up and whatnot. But the the core people still started kept doing it. And then yeah. when we cool. had ours coming on and uh, there was like a bunch a of other resurgence. yeah there was a bunch of yeah. other smaller more um, like a lot of more entertainment podcasts or versus like the right. news and technical podcasts and so like we kind of like rebuilt up this group and like we all got invited into this group that had been uh, like a Facebook group that had right. been dead for a while and whatnot like there hadn't been any posts I'm like oh new members are in and then we all start pos- uh, like trading and whatnot uh, we did a couple crossover episodes with another new podcast and whatnot it's and a community. Yeah, it mm-hmm. really is. Podcasting yeah. is a global community, but it's also a local community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because that's why we did it in LA. That's why we did the festival and we'll continue to do the, the, the podcast festival in Los Angeles because that was us comedians in LA all kind of started a mm-hmm. lot of us out of frustration with Hollywood and let's just talk. But then that's the do thing. something that is your own. It's our own. Yeah. And we controlled it. And it was and that's the thing is you know this as podcasters. Like, hey man, you be on my podcast, I'll be on yours. Yeah. You know, if we both have TV shows and they're both Thursday at eight, well, now we're competing. Right. Mm. Podcasts, we're not. Yeah. And there's, it's like, there's all, there's open listening space. Mm-hmm. So it's like you can set up a queue however you want. It doesn't matter if they got released at the same time. Right. You're going to listen to it when you listen to it. And, and that was the cool thing getting to the, the, the documentary. Mm-hmm. So, like, part of the documentary was, was talking about this community and hearing from fans saying, holy shit, you know, there's this amazing community. And we interviewed fans all over the world and how the community helped people, Mm -hmm. you know, um, like when the Japanese earthquake hit and one of our fans, this woman, Sanai Narita, who's a Japanese housewife and started listening to comedy film nerds on day one and became a fan. And we joke around, call her Sandy and stuff, big fan Japan. (laughs) So she became sort of part of the show and then when the, the, the tsunami and earthquake hit in March of 2011, all of our fans jumped on Twitter like, hey, are you okay? Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, she was in her house with her young son or her husband was gone and she was terrified. And Twitter was the only thing that was working for I don't know why. It was the only thing that was working for her. Mm-hmm. And our fans were talking to her and like, it's going to be okay. Because she couldn't, she didn't know what the fuck, you know, yeah. everything's done. But people are like, well, they're watching the news, like, actually it hit a little further north. Tokyo should be okay. You're like, it's, you know, and it was, it was a thing. And she like, you know, wrote us an email like a month later saying, I can't believe that these people whom I've never met are really being there for me. Yeah. And that's a big part of the, of the interview in, in, in for, for the documentary. And then we show like the festival and, and how everyone comes to the LA pod fest mm-hmm. in the fall every, and, and it's, it's this awesome thing. And now it's like, people are planning their schedules and like, uh, there's a couple was like, it was our 20th wedding anniversary, you wow. know? And that same, that guy from that same couple, they came in, in 2014 it was their 20th anniversary. They came again this year in 15. And he said to me, like a lot of podcast fans, a little, some, some, not all, but some are sort of, maybe they're a little, they're kind of nerdy or outcasts or... Mm, probably a little bit more introverted considering it is a, a fairly mm-hmm. singular experience. Black sheep. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. A lot of that. And he said to me, he goes, you know, my whole life I felt like kind of an outsider until this weekend. And he practically had tears in his eyes. Mm. You know, it's like a Comic Con experience it, all over again. It is because, and everyone loves. It's a weekend of not having to explain what it is. Yeah, <laughs> that whole there's no one that weekend going. Wait, what time is it on? What schedule? That thing yeah. we all of us have to answer. That I mean, once a week, I someone goes, I don't know what it is, and I go, Do you have an iPhone? They go, Yeah. I go, You have an app on your phone. They go, No. I go, Pull out your phone. <laughs> I literally walk them through. I go, See that purple pot? <laughs> Press that. When they're like, Oh wow, who knew? And I'm like, <laughs> So. Um, but that's sort of uh, getting back to the documentary. One of the things we we focused on was was where we're at and where it's going, mm-hmm. because 
it is such a new, 10 years is still not a long time. Oh yeah, brand new still. It's brand new, so there was no, we, did, we, we shot and talked and asked people about the history of it, but realized that just wasn't the story. It's not like something from 40 years ago and like mm. waxing on the early days, well, 2005, like come on, that ain't that. Mm. So um, that, that's, that's I, I'm hoping that Earbuds is sort of the, and one of the people we interview in it, the woman Paige Branson who does, did the artwork for the film, that's the other thing too. Like, the artwork for the film was done by a fan. Yeah. Our web designer is a fan. You yeah, that, that's a really cool thing too, where the community gets to kind of participate in the show, mm-hmm. yeah. which is something that doesn't get to happen uh, in pretty much anything else I mean, that I can think is of. Is anyone doing that? Is anyone just like, hey, is, is, is the Tonight Show going, we need, we need some help? Nope. No. You know? <laughs> I mean... And, and like you were saying, it's very unifying too, because there's podcasts about everything, everything. And, they, and everyone can come together and be like, well, I listen to a tech podcast, or I listen to a comedy podcast, I listen to a news podcast, mm-hmm. whatever. And then it's like, well, we all like podcasts and we can all, you know, tell people about each other's podcasts and we can be like, oh, have you heard these people? They do these incredible things. Like one of my, right. one of my favorite podcasts right now is Harmontown yeah. because it's great comedy. But then like, especially as of late, he's been having these like, little serious moments uh, like he had on not that long ago, he had on uh, someone that he found on Twitter who had just had a double mastectomy <sighs> because she had cancer and everything. And so she just came on and they like, she, she got to sit there and kind of explain what it's like and going through cancer. And like, it, it, there's like a very serious moment within this comedy show that's happening. And it's something that can relate to people who don't necessarily like listen to comedy very much, but they can go listen to this thing and have this like heart well or a heartwarming uh, story that happens and whatnot. And you're going to have people listening going, oh man, I went through cancer and my mom did, or thank mm-hmm. you for sharing. You know, like w- one of the guys we interview in the doc- documentary is, is used to be an intern at Comedy Film Nerds and now he works at Sideshow Network. Oh, wow. He got a, he got a full, he got a, a job. There's like jobs in podcasting now, you know? And he was battling cancer and we talk about that. And he, when we showed the, the, uh, the rough cut at Podfest, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and I said, he goes, Graham, thanks, you know, thanks for doing the film. I go, thank you for like, you know, you didn't have to put your personal life and your medical <laughs> history up on this screen. You didn't have to do that. So thank you. And he goes, Graham, it's, it's people have come up and thanked me because they've been struggling or they know someone was struggling because cancer, there's, you can't find anyone that doesn't know someone exactly that yeah. either won or lost that battle. <laughs> and so, you know, that's the, that's the sort of, the personal beautiful thing about it. Cause if like, you look like we're in a presidential year, right? So we got to watch the new or whatever. And the traditional media, CNN, Fox, whatever is so it's designed to make you pick a side and fight. Mm-hmm. And podcasting doesn't do that. Yeah. Podcasting goes, I don't know. <laughs> you know, you could bring up something we could, we could disagree. You could bring up something and go, Graham, I don't know if I, I, I believe what you just said, or I don't agree. And I, and I'll go, Oh man, oh, yeah, maybe you're right. <laughs> where you can't say that on traditional TV. You gotta go, no, you're, you're wrong. All, and, you're, yeah. blah, blah. and and that's I think that's sort of the magic of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what was one of the amazing things about Joe Rogan's uh podcast. It's because it literally goes everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like he has on some amazing like science people and some amazing political figures, mm-hmm. authors, and comedians and pro fighters and whatnot. And you get to see like the because they, they don't just talk about uh the one thing that they're there for or that they're right. known for. The, the spectrum goes through all kinds of stuff and you get to see that like they're like you, you get to hear your opinion coming out of people that you think you have no nothing mm-hmm. in common with its mouth. Yeah. And it's so amazing that that podcast allows people to do that. Like humanizes his guest. Yes. Kind of, like some relatable. Mm. I think that's it right there. Relatable. Yeah. And also it for me personally, it's helped me I'm a comic I'm a comic, you know, I can be judgmental and you know that's kind of part of being a comic is let's find the stupid shit and make one of it or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's helped me sort of realize that um, there's a lot of sides to many issues. They're mm-hmm. not as black and white as you may think. Mm-hmm. And it, it, uh, I, I like that discussion. And sometimes it's from a fan who writes an email saying, hey, man, you said this on the show the other day, and and I don't know that I agree with it or whatever. And mm-hmm. um, Sometimes you go, oh, well, this person's just really sensitive or, <laughs> or, or they've got some other shit going on that, they need to probably deal with, right, you right, know, yeah. but, but it's, it's, I like, I like getting those emails going, oh, wow, you know, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that, 
you know, just, and it's us, it's always the context of movies, but in the movies, we talk about our personal views and, and mm -hmm. social issues and political issues and stuff like that. And so it's really, it's really cool. Like Star Wars, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of debate about, you know, Ren, you know, she, I think it's great that it's a female hero, mm -hmm. but a lot of people were like, oh, how come she's not being talked about more? How come there's not a more of like action figures of hers and stuff like that? And it's an interesting discussion, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Because the original one was a princess being rescued. Right. Exactly. You know, <laughs> even though she's tough and she's a badass, but she's still a princess that's being rescued, yeah. you know? It, and it's really insane to me, like, uh, cause for the longest time, they've said things. Uh, the The industry has said like you can't have a box office hit with uh, a female or um, minority leads and whatnot. And it's just wrong. Yeah, exactly. And like now, this recently has broken the record. It's busted. Yeah, uh, Avatar and whatnot with it's, a woman and a black man. Exactly, they were the leads. <laughs> so like it's ridiculous. To, it, like it shows. And she's that these tougher than him. Broken. Oh yeah. Easily, yeah. She's like the, you know the whole I mean? the whole scene of uh, let go of my hand. Yeah. Why are you taking my hand? Yeah, which was J.J. Abrams sort of kind of poking fun at the old ones. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think it's great. You know, you you. That's the other thing too about you know getting back to sort of podcasting and new media is all the rules are changing. You know, Hollywood had this. Well, no, this is the way it is. And right. It's like nah, you know, YouTube has changed. You know, one of the great things I, I, I like talking about, I read this article in, in uh, USA Today last year, and they interviewed like four or five big YouTube stars, mm -hmm. millions yeah. of followers. And one, and I forget this girl's name, but, uh, you know, 20-something black girl has this show called, I think it's called like Stupid Shit White Girls Say or something like that. <laughs> so she just <laughs> dresses up like white girls and says all the dumb crap that they say. <laughs> and it's hilarious. Like, oh, my God, how, you know, how do you put lipstick on those big laps? And just shit that's <laughs> actually, that has actually been said to her, right? Yeah. Millions of followers. People love it. Kind of educating a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she said in the, in the article, she said, do you think a, t a TV network would give me this show? She goes, the internet is so democratic. Yeah. Put it out there. If people like it. It gets shared. Mm -hmm. That's that. There's no Nielsen ratings. There's no executives in a room saying, no, we're moving your time slot around. Or you don't fit our model. You guys, you know, we need to change the title or whatever. You right. Know? Like. <laughs> yeah, it, it allows you to, to express the way you want to be creative. Directly to your viewers, too. You know, there's no people in between trying to stick their hands in and muddy it up to support their own ideologies and all that stuff. It's like really pure, very, you know, yeah. yourself. And I think it gives you a real Ooh. feeling of how like your success is your success and your failures are your failures. It's yours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, and you get to change it. Yeah, exactly. Like if, you, if a bunch of fans email and say, why don't you do more of this? Well, we'll, go, we'll change it. Yeah. Like, why don't we hear some fucking freestyle rapping on this? Okay. <laughs> fucking throw it down. If you want to do that, fuck through, who's going to... <laughs> well, we got to check with the network and the, no, yeah. just, exactly. <laughs> just yeah. do it. Like, that's what I love. I tell yeah. people all the time, like, oh, I have this. I really like, like the thing I like to say to, to like when new people are coming to me going, what kind of podcast should I do? I go find the thing you love talking about. Mm. That's it. Don't go into it like, oh, how do I become famous? Or I want a TV show like Mark Maron or something mm -hmm. like that. No, man. What do you want to talk about? Yeah, and and that's one of the the the, great, the best things about this is because uh, the it's kind of about the subcultures that are here mm -hmm. in Hawaii and the little scenes and whatnot. Uh, the and we let the conversation just kind of go wherever it goes, so we can talk about film, which I'm deeply in love with. We can talk about comedy. We can get into hip hop and all this other stuff. And so, like, we're we're able to to like just let it go where it goes, and everyone can can. Uh, um, be educated or have their like put their opinion out there and you can one of the things that i love about our podcast is that like when we are getting into the subjects that we really really enjoy you can like feel the passion that we're talking about it mm -hmm. mm. like we're getting to like view these opinions or like like so many times especially uh for myself and i'm sure cozy has had some uh, uh things happen where like we want to talk about something amongst like the little group of friends that we have and then it's very clear that it's like 
oh, they don't want to hear any of this right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I need to shut up for a while. <laughs> but and, your podcast yeah. fans do. Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah that's exactly. what the best part about it is we're able to just kind of, like, let things go and just, like, I, talk I for a while. I think, too, you guys have an interesting opportunity in the sense of, like, you know, um, most people in the world, especially in the mainland, probably have a very specific idea of what Hawaii is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's just the, like, palm trees and the luau's and shit. Yeah, the stereotypes, oh, yeah. definitely, yeah. definitely. So what are the biggest things, like, you guys like breaking down? Or what do you want to, like, what's something, what's a subculture here that you think people in the mainland wouldn't know about? Uh, well, in general, like, we have a, a pretty interesting rock and hip-hop scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, both of those, like, they're, they're both still relatively small. Yeah. Uh, but the, it's not for, the, the, one of the troubles with the, the subcultures here is that there? There's no infrastructure to help people grow. How uh, so? Yeah. Just like so, not enough clubs. Well, like venues are. Yeah, like so much of it is based off promoters. of promoters. Just like because no one who's a promoter per se, uh, like owns the bars. So like we all like th- there's like that whole you have to check with this person for this thing or this and mm-hmm. that. And the thing is, the people who are in power that are able to allow these scenes to grow often are just like it's not like they don't want them to they just don't care enough to like go out of their way they're just the money person who yeah. just like mm-hmm. i just need this bar to turn a profit and i don't care how right. kind of thing they're not really interested in like yeah. curating of creativity uh-huh. yeah a, a perfect example is um oh, last year i tried to do a show kind of based off of um uh mst3k and uh um uh, doug or um D- the benson. doug benson and movie, movie interruption, interruption. yeah uh, and I was able with the, the, there was a bar manager that was there, uh, that I worked with and he was super cool and we got everything set up and ready to go. And then like three weeks before my show happened, he got fired. And so then I had to deal with the owner cause he didn't, he, he didn't have a new bar manager. So I started right. dealing with the owner and it became very clear, very quickly. He gave no shits whatsoever. Right. And so. Uh, everything got pushed to last minute. Uh, then when we came for the time of the show, cause it was a brand new bar and we were going to be like this opening mm-hmm. show thing. Uh, when it came time for, uh, the show night, he didn't even have his, like, uh, the liquor license that was required to have performances occur. <laughs> and so like it was on a, it, it was on star Wars day. We did, we, we, we interrupted star Wars essentially. Right. Uh, and, like I ended up having to have Cozy bring down a speaker uh, oh, yeah. because their sound <laughs> system, they didn't have a sound guy that uh, would allow me to, to mess with it enough to be able to have uh, our voices come through the sound system. So we had to bring in a speaker, plug our voices through the speaker. So we just had a speaker in the back with our voices going. And we tried to do the show as best as possible. But of course, the bar didn't promote it. I tried to promote it as best <laughs> as I could. Everything just went to crap because you could tell like they didn't care at all. Is that is that similar cozy with like hip hop as well? And well, with the hip hop scene, it's like um, there's a whole like monopoly on the venues that p- people are allowed to perform at because there's not much. There's really not much there. And with the uh, the exposure of opening acts, like when there's a big hip hop show, it's always the same. Maybe two or three artists um that get to open for these big shows and hawaii has a very deep and rich history in hip-hop that goes back to like the 1980s and people that have been doing it for a long time never got you know it's it's all about paying dues right sure and having that work not recognized by a promoter who doesn't care to look any further than the people that they know you know Uh. to 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 try and cultivate that uh that that culture by allowing them a uh, platform to perform at it kind of you know it's got it you know what i mean yeah, no, i know i know exactly <laughs> what you mean dude i've seen all different kinds of scenes and like the thing you just described with the bringing your own mic and everything <laughs> dude i could that's a whole nother show i could just <clears throat> we could just talk about shit gigs and just, oh, yeah. just fucking hell gigs the promoter didn't care it wasn't you know there was somebody posted a sign some comic posted a sign on Facebook that was like, uh, even if the comics suck, the wings are 35 cents. And it was just like, (laughs) I just can imagine like every comic has rolled up to some gig at some bar where they didn't know what they were doing and didn't care. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're they're They care more about the fucking chicken wings than the, what's happening on stage. Yeah. And it is a dilemma that it is. It is a lot of things everywhere now. 
I think it's fu- it's funny you say that. Just in talking with James Monet over the years and listening to you guys talk, there's such an opportunity here. I think there's a real opportunity here. And I'm just sitting here listening to you guys for the second one. Man, I wish I had the money. If I had some real money, I'd come in here and buy up some venues mm-hmm. and go, here's how we're going to lay it down. That's what we've been trying to do forever, <laughs> but we can't make money. It's so expensive here. There's sure. so many people here on the islands that have been like, we're going to have our own venue and we're going to do all this stuff. And it, it, because it's so expensive just to exist in Hawaii. Yeah. Like, I've been trying to move the past couple of years, and I can't... I'm too poor mm. to move. <laughs> That's another issue, too, with people moving. Like, I, I, had a re- I had a really deep, like, crew of people that I worked really hard with to push our music out, and eventually they start getting frustrated, and then they leave the island, and, oh. like, the people that are left behind are kind of have to, like, start from the bottom again, you know, to try and build something up because other people have left because... Just because it's so frustrating to be creative out here, I guess. Yeah, I've moved through um, three different uh, subculture scenes now. I, I started off uh, first uh, working in like the raves and EDM right. music and whatnot. I did sound and lighting for that. And um, I've seen people come, get really big, and then I've just seen it all get shut down again. Like right now, we're like the, the, the EDM scene here is now restricted completely to clubs. We used to have like huge massives and whatnot. Like Love Fest was started here, and now it's a touring festival and whatnot. Wow. And so, like, we had these big, big things, and it just got so big, and then it just went down because it, it, their, their, part of their problem was the wrong people were showing up to the shows because it was so big now. There were, like, fights breaking out. Oh, and, yeah, that's... Yeah, there was that kind of thing happening. But then, like, also, too, as it started to get bigger, there was a lot of, like, infighting started happening. And then because infighting happening, the, like, sh- turnout was going down on places, so then venues started turning on promoters and oh, stuff like yeah. that. It just went... Like you, I saw everything. Like, oh, everything's going great. Mm. Oh, what's happening? Oh, and then just everything was now. Now all the like the bigger DJs that have stayed because they, they're telling me the same thing happened in 2000. Like leading up to the years leading up to 2000, uh, from like 95 up, everything was going great. Everything was going really big, big, and then 2000 hit and everything just went boop. And everyone like the few people who stayed just kind of went underground. Just started doing radio gigs, did uh, like clubs and stuff like that, doing a DJ and stuff like that. And then slowly around 2005, 2006, they started slowly building it back up, trying to keep it small and not letting that happen again. And sure enough, like people get interested in like, oh, we're going to do it too. So like you try and support them and help them and teach them how to do it right. And then they end up not teaching the same things to right. other people or whatever happens. And then just slowly gets too big and then pop, everything goes back down again. And that's exactly <laughs> so what happened in, two, in 2000. It happened again uh, basically two years ago now. Wow. And then so now I'm seeing the comedy scene for the past three or four years. Uh, and you see one of the things that has always kind of stunned me is there's a lot of infighting in the comedy scene. Like for it just, I guess people get their their egos up or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, why aren't you putting me on this show and this and that? Well, yeah. well all comics sometimes there's a lot of yeah. sense of entitlement of if I'm a comic, I should be on every show. Yeah, and so and that's not possible. Exactly. Yeah, and some people don't get that or whatever it is, but and, and I've seen so many really good comics who were doing something here, like um. Like we're really lucky that James stayed, and one of his partners, uh, Michael C. Hall, he mm-hmm. was one of the other people that was helping build up this right. scene. Mike left. He was like, I, I can't deal with the drama right now. These plans that he had several plans in work. Uh, he was actually I was working with him to try and set up uh, a club here that would be a comics club, right. comics run and whatnot. And uh, what ended up happening is just so many things ended up getting in the way of that that he was just like, I can't do it anymore, and he left and went back to. Um, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw him there last year. Yeah, great guy, too. Yeah, and yeah, he was yeah. working on He's so really, many I met him early on. He opened for me at a gig I did on Schofield Barracks, like mm-hmm. in 2011 or something like that. Yeah, I know. That's a tough... I've seen it. I've Yeah, I mean, Oklahoma City or, uh, or Tulsa... Um, one of those places, I think it was Oklahoma City. Yeah, I did some shows with Doug there, and they were they were starting to scene and bringing acts in and the whole thing. But it, then it's there's all these factors that come in that get hard if you mm-hmm. can't support it. Uh, and the venues, you know, they have overhead. Yeah, and you got to sell tickets and mm-hmm. you got to sell drinks. And how do you do that? And if tickets aren't selling, then it's like, and sometimes club owners or promoters get scared, and then mm-hmm. they're just mm-hmm. like they do crazy shit just to get anybody in there. Whatever we got to do, get them in there, and yeah. then. 
it, it, it can, it can, I, I can see how that happened anywhere. And I think there's even, it's even tougher. It seems like here in the sense, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's an insurmountable challenge, but mm. no, I mean, you, you can see that we're working on it. The, one mm-hmm. of the, the key things that's helped out a lot is, um, the owners here at Hawaiian Brian's have been amazing. They're great. I mean, they're so supportive and whatnot. Like they, they make it uh, uh, as cheap for us to to operate, mm-hmm. so that that way, like, and we have a, a good setup with them, where it's just like we don't we don't have to pay a terrible ton of fees or anything like that. We don't have to pay for them to turn on the sound and all this other right. stuff. So it makes it easy for us to keep doing what we're doing and keep bringing people. Like we can concentrate on making the show good, right? So that makes sure that people come back and to bring their friends and when they come back and whatnot. So like we started to build like a right. little comedy scene of people who come out to watch the comedy shows and whatnot. And we couldn't have done that if we didn't have a venue that treats us as well as uh, as Hawaiian. They've Lions done a great does. job. This, I think, this is my maybe my third time performing here, mm-hmm. third year in a row, maybe of doing show, some some show at Hawaiian Brian's. Mm-hmm. We did Comedy Film Arts podcast here once, yes, like, two years ago. That's it's, where I got the shirt. Oh, awesome, dude! Like yeah. it's that's that that is cool. You do have a good venue here, mm-hmm. and they've got several stages and several rooms. So I don't know. I hope it. I hope it. Yeah, and, and it's growing well. Like when we when we first started doing comedy here, they just had essentially two rooms uh, right. they had the big crossroads and the studio and then they've recently did a whole bunch of more renovations they made the studio even better put a new sound and all this stuff they've made crossroads even better with these little like side booths right. and all these other things going on better sound in there the room that we're in right now is a more of a dj electronic scene one this called room electron. didn't exist a couple years no, ago yeah this was storage and they were like well we don't need that storage because we have this storage. Let's uh, turn this into another whole venue. And so now this is a whole other venue that we get to sit here and talk about this. And then in like two hours when we're done with this, there's going to be a DJ in here and it's going to be flooded with people. <laughs> that's awesome, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like it's such a great venue. Like, th- like th- that's one thing that I can't stress enough is how supportive Hawaiian Brian's has been of, of everything creative. Like they, mm-hmm. uh, they do stuff with every scene out here right. so like they have rock shows here they have hip-hop they have art galleries they have that's really comedy cool. they have everything and it's so amazing it's it's really fun to be able to like be here for the past couple of years and see hawaiian brian's turn into what it is now that's great mm-hmm. that's good to hear yeah. so i think uh your show is going to be starting pretty soon yeah we'll uh get wrapping this up uh do you have anything that you'd like to plug sure man um Let's see. You can listen to Comedy Film Nerds podcast. We're on iTunes. We actually have our own iTunes page. Oh, wow. Uh, iTunes.com uh, slash CFN. And on there is our podcast. Plus, uh, iTunes, is, we're the first one that they've sort of done this with. Huh. Where they, like, people who've been on our show, like, let's say Jackie Cation, like, her album, you can download it through us, through the, the Comedy oh, wow, Film that's Nerds so cool. page. Yeah, and movies we recommend, movies we've talked about, movies we've made. So if you see anything through there if you buy it through our page we get a little taste you know we get a little percentage of it so uh it's cool it's sort of a curated comedy film nerds itunes page that's so Um, cool yeah so that's the best way to listen to the show and um you know los angeles podcast festival we're about to announce the dates for next year we have those locked in and then tickets go on sale in february so uh, it'll be in september so when the dates come out, you know, if anybody listening here in uh, Oahu or wherever, if you can make it to Los Angeles, come out. It's one of the coolest things. One of the things we do every year, we've had uh, Squarespace has been one of our sponsors. They do the Squarespace Lab. So smaller shows can come, and it's this room, and you can bring your recording gear. And shows have come from all over the world, and they're getting interviews with all these big name comics. Oh, wow. Mark Maron. Yeah, go, you know, yeah, I'm no. telling you, you guys should come. You would love it. You would absolutely love it. And you'd get a bunch of great interviews and you'd just meet the, the podcasting community and who knows where it goes from there. Mm. And then everyone's, t- and then your guests on shows and they're talking you up and you're like, come on out to the island and you guys can set shit up out there, out here. You could set up some sort of thing out there. I mean, who knows? It's, that's what it's, that's what I want. I want people to first just have fun. Mm-hmm. Like, See your favorite shows, meet friends, laugh, and then I want some. I want to do some business. You know what I mean? Like I'm yeah. all about it. Build I think, the connections. Yeah, yeah, build the connections, man. So come on out to LA Podfest. The dates are going to be announced soon. Uh, any word on earbuds when we got a release date? Because <laughs> I want to see that so bad. I get asked this every day, um, but no, which is good. I'm glad it's it's it's. The movie is almost. We've been started to submit it to festivals. Mm-hmm. 
it's literally next week is going to be like done, done. Like the picture's locked. We're finishing color correction. The sound mix is almost done. The composer, Andy Creighton, he's got his band, The World Record. They did a great job. <laughs> um, so uh, Dave Schmidt at Acapella Audio did the sound mix on Afghanistan, the other film I directed, mm-hmm. uh, which had horrible sound. And he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a miracle worker. And we had pretty good sound for Earbud. So the movie's almost done, done. We're going to do, uh, you know, six months or so, six to nine months of festivals, mm-hmm. um, provided we get in them. And, uh, and I think we're, the goal is to have it for sale uh, by PodFest. Okay, cool. Nice. Regardless of whatever happens awesome. with it, unless some big distributor comes in and says we want to release it after that, but that's the goal. Cool. So anyone who donate on Kickstarter, you'll get your rewards by the fall, yeah. and then. And I'm excited for that. And uh, when uh, when more news comes out of it, we'll we'll pump it up on this podcast. Thanks, also. dude. Yeah. So just stay. T- you're any earbuds info. Stay tuned to Comedy Film Nerds. We're at Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that at Comedy Film Nerds, and dot com, of course. Yes. <laughs> Great website, too. Really good uh, movie reviews. Thanks, dude. Yeah. Cozy, what you got coming? Uh, Not much. I'm just doing my vlogs, you know, trying to do the vlog thing. YouTube.com slash John Cozy TV. You can find us at alohabroha.com and check out all the past episodes. And you can also subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, and your favorite podcast app. Just search keyword Aloha Broha. And comedy coming up this uh Coming up soon is uh, January 30th. We have Jay Larson featuring Matt Monroe here at Hawaiian Brian's. Nice. Yeah. And uh, you, can get, you can get tickets for that at squadup.com. Uh, then in February 27th, we have Ben Bailey also at HawaiianBrian's.com. Or Hawaiian Brian's, the venue. Go to squadup.com to get tickets there. And uh, uh, April 16th, Cameron Esposito featuring Rhea Butcher. Nice. Again, HawaiianBrian's.com, squadup.com. I keep saying HawaiianBrian's.com. Uh, wouldn't it be weird if Bill Murray showed up right now? 